Today we are continuing in our series called Sex God's Way, and today is actually part number three of a nine-part series that we're in. If you're newer to our church, newer to our broadcast, first off, we want to say welcome. We don't believe that you're here by an accident. We actually pray and we say, God, would you just send people to our church? Let people find us online that wasn't even looking for us but need a word from you. Doesn't matter their race, their background, their age. Let them just have people that want to go further in you. Doesn't matter what you even believe. I don't believe that you have found us by accident. I believe this is the divine timing of God. If you believe that, somebody say amen. Amen. And I believe that I'm going to share some things that are going to be counterculture today. But if your heart is open to God's word, I believe your life will never be the same again. I don't want to give you an opinion today. I want to give you the Bible today. Lord Jesus. (laughs) We're going to give you the Bible today, and it's going to be good. But I want to bring our entire class onto the same page, so let's recap. Over the last two weeks, we learned that sex is beautiful, that sex is wonderful, that sex is holy, that sex is pure, that sex, I got one person on the front row saying amen that got a revelation. It's great when it's done God's way, with the right person, in the right timing, in the right way. That's what we call sex God's way. And sex God's way is great. But we've also learned that sex outside of the parameters that God has established for us to enjoy sex in, it's not so great. It actually leads to sexual trauma, sexual confusion, dysphoria, sexual diseases, strongholds, soul ties, generational curses, and etc. Because sex outside of God's way is what the Bible calls sin. And we've learned that sin is defined as missing the mark. Everybody say missing the mark. That means that God has a mark that we should hit or he has a standard and sin says, I don't care what God says, I want to do what I want to do. I don't care about God's standard, I'm going to make up my own standard. I don't care what he says, I'm going to live how I want to live. And that attitude of rebellion towards God is what the Bible calls sin. And we've learned over the first two weeks of this series is that sin creates bondage. Sin can actually hinder your fellowship with God. Sin actually opens up doors to the demonic. I guess what I'm saying, church, is that sin is not your friend. And sin might look good. Sin might even feel good. Matter of fact, that Satan's job as an enticer to make wrong seem like it's right. And so actually sin is fun. Sin looks good. Sin sometimes feel good, but sin can actually kill you. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says that the wages of sin is death. That means the cost. Everybody say the cost. The cost of your sin is actually killing you. And because it doesn't happen right away, you are led to continue in it because you don't think there's any repercussions behind it. But your sin has a cost and a price tag, and it's killing you softly. Come on, Lauren Hill. It's, it's killing you. It's the wages of your sin is both death physically and also spiritually, so sin is not your friend. Last week, we learned that the Bible calls sexual sins sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is the theme. It's kind of the heading of the sexual sins. Throughout the Bible, you'll see this theme with sub-themes. You'll see this topic of sexual immorality with certain topics under it. And so when we talk about sexual immorality, we understand that that is the blanket, but under the blanket or the heading of that topic, there are certain specific sins. For a list of some freaky deaky stuff, look at Leviticus chapter 18, and it will lay it all out for you. But under the banner of sexual immorality are sins like, this is what the Bible says, bestiality, incest, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, lust, and also pornography. Those are all, we're not just picking out one, but these are all under the banner of sexual immorality. And this is what scripture says, 1 Corinthians 6.18, it says, flee from sexual immorality. Because every other person, a sin a person commits is outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against his own body. And you are the temple of God, so when you sin sexually, you're actually sinning against the house of God. And so the word flee, and that's what it says, it doesn't say fight, but it says flee. Because you can't just fight sexual sin, sometimes you got to flee from it. And the word flee is a very strong word in the Greek. It literally means to run in terror. And so when it says to flee sexual immorality, it's not just fighting it. It's like you need to pick up your stuff, put on your clothes, get out of that atmosphere, get out of that relationship, leave that boyfriend, leave that girlfriend, get away from those people. You got to run in terror to go towards who God's called you to be. Would the church say amen? Amen. Last week, I told you guys my story. 
and it's a true story, but for years I lived a life of sexual immorality. I'm not proud of it. It was a long time ago. I thank God that I'm forgiven now and I'm delivered, but I protected my sexual immorality. I cherished my sexual immorality. I led other people into living sexually immoral lifestyles with me. I wasn't a bad person, but I was blind. I wasn't a bad person, meaning that if you met me, you'd be like, oh, that's a nice young man. But the truth is, is that I was blind. I was blind to his way because I wanted to do what I wanted to do with my sexuality. And so I did not know this that I know now is that actually I thought I was having fun, but I was actually a slave. And I know many of you all, you want absolutely nothing to do with slavery, but there's a lot of slaves who is in this joint today. The scripture says it this way in John 8, 34, it says, most surely I say to you that whoever practices sin is actually the slave to sin. And so I was bound to something that I didn't even know, but thank God that two verses later in John chapter 8, 36, it says, so if the son sets you free, glory to God, you'll be free indeed. And so our big takeaway from last week is that freedom is available for everybody. Go ahead and push your neighbor and tell them freedom is available for you. Glory to God. Hey, but freedom is only found in Jesus. Amen. Everything outside of Jesus might look like it's freedom, but it ain't free. It's going to cost you something. And the world has this way of having sexual freedom of just go out and do whatever you want to do with whoever you want to do it with. But write this down. Sexual freedom is not freedom if it leads to bondage. Satan has a way of making sexual freedom look like real freedom, but actually it's real slavery because sexual freedom is not freedom when it leads to bondage. And I know some of you all have been taught online, some of you all believe that I am my own person, I can do whatever I wanna do, and we've been taught that real freedom is found in doing what we wanna do, but it's a lie. And the truth is found in John chapter eight, verse 31, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold on to my teaching, you're my real disciples, and you'll know the truth. Somebody shout, know the truth. And the truth will what? Somebody shall set me free. free. Write this down. Sexual freedom is not freedom if it leads to bondage. Sexual freedom is only freedom when it's founded in truth. So today, I'm glad you're here. Go ahead and tell your neighbor, I'm glad you came today. Because some of y'all thought about skipping church. And I'm glad you didn't listen to the devil on this one. Because you need part three. Today's message is entitled, Overcoming the Lies of Satan. And at the end, I want to give you three keys to walking in truth. I've been in ministry for 20 years. I've read the Bible so much. And I had never seen truth like I saw it when I prepared for this message. I think today is going to be remarkable, meaning that you're going to be marked by today and never be the same again. I believe that. Write this down. If we're going to be free, we must walk in truth. But you cannot walk in truth if you're believing lies. One more again for the, for the people in the back. If we're going to be free, we got to walk in truth. But you cannot walk in truth if you're believing the lies. How many of y'all know it's a lot of lies out there nowadays? A whole lot of lies. Because the best lies seem like truths. They are manipulations of the truth. They are perversions of the truth. They are not full lies. They're half lies. But half lies are still lies. And so Satan, what he does is he makes a lie look like the truth and the truth look like the lie. And he gives you half lies because it's a deflection from the truth. And whatever leads you from what's really true is actually a lie. And I feel the Holy Ghost is asking us today to make much of the truth, that we will be a people that make much of the truth, that we will be a church that will share truth with people, to embrace embrace truth, to walk in truth, to speak truth to people. I'm not talking about you gotta go out and just blast everybody with truth and you know that they're not receiving it, but I'm talking about I'm giving my kids truth. You need to go home and you need to give your kids and grandkids, you need to give them truth. People that say they love you, that you're close to, you need to sit down with them and give them truth. Not just truth, but truth and love, but truth nonetheless, because it's only truth that has set us free. I want to answer a few common questions today that I know some of you guys are asking. For those of you all who are newer to our church, welcome. What does the Bible say about truth? John 14 and 6. Go there with me very quickly, and we're actually going to read this together. Y'all ready for this? Ready, read. Jesus answered. He says, I am the way and the truth, and the what? No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, how many of you all love Jesus? Let me see by show of hands. Some of you all are new to church, and hopefully you will grow in love with Jesus, the one that gave his life so that you could live. But here's the thing about Jesus. 
We've studied Jesus in Scripture, and we found out that Jesus is Emmanuel. Somebody say Emmanuel. That means he's God with us. Jesus is our redeemer. He is our high priest. He is our good shepherd. He is the Lord of lords and the kings, uh, king of kings. He is our savior. And all of these titles or attributes give us a glimpse to the person of the Son of God, of who he is, so that we can know him better and serve him more faithfully. But in John chapter 14, verse number 16, he calls himself something that is rare and unique, meaning that I don't hear a lot of people talking about this attribute of Jesus. Jesus says that I am the truth. Everybody say the truth. We know him as the Son of God and Savior and Lord, but do we know him as the truth? So what we know is that all spiritual truths start with the foundation of Jesus. And so if you ever are a spiritual person or you believe something about the unseen realm that does not found itself in Jesus, you are believing a lie. Because all truth starts with the truth and his name is Jesus. And so if Jesus is not at the center of our soul, if he's not at the center of our doctrine, if he is not at the center of what we believe, we're believing a lie because Jesus is the truth. Everybody say the truth. the truth. Go with me over to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And we're going to look at verse 13. Are y'all doing okay? Yeah. Let's read verse 13 together. Ready, read. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will do what? Guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is to come. Meaning that God doesn't want us to be in the dark. The Holy Spirit will reveal the Bible to us. He will reveal the will of God to us. But here's something interesting because John chapter 16 is talking about who? The Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune nature of God. And this is what we know about the Holy Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit is a comforter. We know that the Holy Spirit is a counselor. We know that the Holy Spirit is um, a helper. Matter of fact, the word comforter in the Greek means parakletos. And the definition of the Holy Spirit is he's a standby or advocate. He's an intercessor. He's a helper, etc. Okay. But here in John chapter 16, bring it back up. It says that he's also the spirit of truth. <laughs> Hold on for a second. Are you telling me that two thirds of the Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, two of them call themselves the truth? That Jesus says, I'm the truth. And the Holy Spirit calls himself the spirit of truth. Two thirds of the triune nature of God has the word truth inside of how he describes himself, okay? So the Holy Spirit's job is to lead us to Jesus. So the spirit of truth is leading us to truth. Why? So that you can't be bound but be free. That's the will of God. That's why you're here today. Would somebody say amen? Mm. Go to John 17 and 17. Oh, I love God's word. Let's read John 17 and 17 together. Ready, read. It says, sanctify by, by your truth, your word. Did everybody get that? Now, what does the word sanctify mean, class? Set apart. It's also the word holy means sanctified or set apart. So you cannot be holy if you don't have truth. You are set apart or made holy by your reception of truth. If you reject the truth, you can't be sanctified. You cannot be set apart. So when the scripture says be holy like he is holy, what it's saying is that you've received the truth. And then it ends with this. It says your word is true. His word is true. His word is, oh man, is this thing on today? His, everybody say his word, his word, his word, his word, his word is true. So we live in a day and time that says, well, I'm just living out my truth, you know, and you live your truth and I'm going to live my truth. What they're saying is that truth is relative. Nobody really knows what the truth is. So instead of doing what anybody tells me to do, what the suggestion is, the subconscious suggestion is do whatever you want to do because I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And so what it's common today is you living out your truth and I'm living out my truth and our truth is a lie. And I need somebody to hear that today, that your truth you're living out is a lie and my truth is a lie because the scripture says that every man is a liar and only God and his word is true. Amen. And so you're a liar and I'm a liar until we submit our truth to the truth of Jesus. Amen. And when we submit our truth, so it's not about my truth. My truth is a lie. Your truth is a lie. His truth is truth. And so the truth is in the word of God. And so I know that some of you all have been fought for your Bible. The reason why the devil fights you for your Bible is because it's your one offensive weapon. It's the sword of the spirit. So what the devil wants to do is take your sword so that you can't beat him. 
He wants to take your sword because when you ain't got the sword, you don't have any truth. And if you don't have truth, then you can't be free. And he loves people to be in bondage. And so he tells you that it's been rewritten and you can't put your confidence in it. And it's been changed and all that. What he's trying to do is distract you from the truth because his word is truth. His word is truth. His word is truth. And only truth can make you free. And so when you say, Pastor, how should I be looking at dating? Go to the Bible. Pastor, how should I steward money? Go to the Bible. Pastor, how should I be looking at my sexuality? Don't live based upon how you feel. Go to the Bible because his word is true. And the truth shall make us free. Y'all with me today? Class, what's the opposite of truth? Who's the father of lies? John chapter 8, y'all good class. John chapter 8, verse 44. He's talking about the wicked here, and he says, you belong to, the, to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks of his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He's the OG of lying. He's the original gangster of lies. He is the one that perverts the truth and makes a lie. He is the creator of the lie. There's no professional athlete, okay? Now, I'm a, I'm a big sports person. Any sports people here? Okay. Now, 75% of what I watch is sports center. I need to break this addiction. I do realize that, but it's just what I enjoy. And what I've noticed about sporting events is sometimes there's a big game that's coming up. The reporters will come up and they'll ask some of the best players. They say, you know who you're playing and tomorrow? You know who you're playing? You know how good they are? You know how many championships they have, so forth and so on. You know how their offense is. You know how their defense is. And they'll ask this to somebody on the other team. What are you guys going to do to stop them? And that sports player will say, well, you know what? We don't really care about what they are. We're just going to play our game. You know, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're just, we're just going to play our game. We're going to play Miami Heat basketball. We're going to play Orlando Magic basketball. We're going to play Tampa Bay football. We don't care about how many championships so-and-so won. We don't care about what they're doing. We feel like if we can just play our best game, then we can beat anybody. Now, that's what they say publicly, and that's great psychology. <laughs> but honestly, there is a coach. His full-time responsibility is to scout the opposition. There is somebody who is paid to go across and watch film, go to games of the opposition to learn their weaknesses and their strengths, to bring back a game plan so that you won't lose in battle. Come on, somebody. So really what sports people do is they say that, but they're really studying film. All right. Now, now, especially when it comes to combat sports like boxing. So in boxing, you don't want to get in a ring if you haven't studied your opponent. So if they have a quick right hook that you don't, so you need to study how they move before they take that right hook or that uppercut or you will get knocked out, <laughs> right? So what do you do? You study your enemy. You study your opponent. You study what they do well and you study their weaknesses, same as it is in your faith. You have to understand that you are in a battle with a fallen angel named Lucifer that would love to exploit you, but you need to know the tactics of your enemy. Y'all not with me. Second Corinthians chapter two, watch this, verse, um, ch chapter number two, verse number 11, it says, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are unaware of his schemes. Do you know how many people love Jesus, but they don't even believe in the devil? You already losing. You don't even believe that you're in a fight. <laughs> They are unaware of his schemes, unaware of his strategies, unaware of his tactics. So when you're in, a, in opposition, you want to know what is the strategy of the enemy? What is the tactics? Now, I don't know. I believe that whenever you get born again, one of the first classes or sessions or small groups you should go to is you got to figure out or just get your Bible and start to study the origin of Satan and his tactics and strategies. Because you cannot win in a battle if you don't know how he's going to come at you. And when you look at the origin of Satan, you will find a few things. Number one, his name Satan means accuser. He's an accuser. He's a deceiver, right? He's a murderer, right? This is who he is. He's a tormentor. He entices us to rebel against God, to do things our own way. He attacks us with sickness, disease, depression, condemnation, low self-esteem. He lies about others. He causes you to lie about yourself. You know, a host of other tools that he uses, but his most common tool in the toolbox, do you know what it is? 
lies. It is the most common. Now, I know that he is portrayed as this guy with a red cape on and little horns. I'm, the devil never comes like that. He actually is an angel of light, and he looks like a good thing. He's lying from the beginning. His very nature is a lie. He shows up like a, a God thing, but he ain't God at all. You know what I'm saying? It looks like the right thing, but it's actually the wrong thing. His number one tool in his toolbox is lying, and he lies to us about everything. He will tell you that you're not good enough. He will tell you that you were a mistake. You shouldn't even have been born. He will tell you that you're not worthy of love because you've been through a divorce. He will tell you that you're never going to amount to anything. Look at who do you think you are being around all these other successful people. You know what you did last night. He will tell you that you're nothing but a sinner. He will tell you that you are all alone. Nobody even cares if you took your own life tonight because he is a liar. He will tell you that God's not real. He will tell you that you can't trust God. You can't trust people. You can only trust yourself because he is a liar. He will tell you that the Bible is not real, that it's not for today. He will tell you that you cannot trust it because it's been written by man. It's been changed by man. He will tell you all of that because he is a liar. And at some point, you got to put your foot down and call a lie a lie. You really do. You just got to say, that's a lie. That's a lie. And then you got to replace a lie with the truth. So when he tells you you're going to die early, you got to say, that's a lie. I shall live and not die. The number of my days I will fulfill. When he tells you you're about to get in a plane crash, that's a lie. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. When he tells you God doesn't love me, that's a lie. He put his only begotten son on the cross and blotted, died a bloody death so that I could live with him for eternity. Come on, somebody. When he says God's not real, that's a lie. I see the working of God everywhere. My DNA, my fingerprint. I see the handiwork of God in the tide, in the ocean. I didn't come from apes, baby. I didn't come from a, a tadpole, baby. I didn't come from explosion. I've been made in the image and likeness of God. You got to begin to call a lie what it is. Somebody shout, that's a lie. And you got to replace a lie with the truth. It's only truth that'll make us free. Are y'all with me now? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 actually has the spirit of our series. And it says, instead, we got to speak the truth in love. The truth in love. Everybody say the truth in love. Yeah. Online, put it in the comments. The truth in love. The truth in love. The truth. And I, I love y'all enough that I'm going to give you some truths today. But if you can give a give me back the lie or don't give it to me. I don't want it. Send it back to hell where it came from. And you can receive truth. You're going to leave out of this place free. And I want to give you the truth in love. And I, I feel like there's some people, they're scared of giving people the truth nowadays because they don't want to be canceled. Cancel me. I don't give a care. As long as I'm not canceled in the eyes of God, if God be for me, who can be against me? Some of y'all need to let go of your fear of the world. The world shouldn't be manipulating the church and controlling the church. Now, I'm going to love the world, but I'm going to give them truth. Okay, so my name is Ken and I'm your friend. I'm not here to judge you or hurt you, I'm here to help you. But I want to go over some very common lies. Matter of fact, that's what I want to do. I want to take the rest of today and I want to go over 17 common lies and I want you to replace them with the truth. Now I had over 20 and I tried to get it down to 15 or 10 because I felt that that would be a, a, a better number, but I couldn't. I was trying to erase some of the 17, and it was just, no, I got to say that one. Oh, Lord, they need, to, they need to know that one. So I had over 20. Thank God I got down to 17. Now, listen, we might not have the time today to get through all 17 of them, but I'm going to give you my best shot. If you're ready, put your hands together right there and say, we ready, we ready, come on, we ready. Are y'all ready? Are you ready? Come on online, are you ready? First lie. Y'all ready for the first lie? God's purpose for sex was just for us to reproduce. That's a lie. It's not true. God created sex for three main purposes. Number one is procreation, for us to reproduce, but also for the consummation of marriage. So when a woman's hymen is broken through sex, there is a blood covenant that's supposed to be established between husband and wife. Yes. Not all the time. I understand there's defects and different things like that, but that's a God's original plan. And number three, for enjoyment. Now, some of you all love Jesus so much, but you don't love your sex life and you're married. I would encourage you to go home and read the Songs of Solomon and figure out that this is an area of intimacy and enjoyment between a married man and a married woman. Yes, Come to my podcast if you don't believe me. Number two, virginity is something that you need to get rid of as soon as you can. Somebody say, that's a lie. That's a lie. Being a virgin isn't a weak thing. It's a position of strength. <sighs> Some of you all have been trying to give your virginity away because you don't understand that that is actually a gift. 
that you are supposed to give your spouse after they say, I do. Okay? When you say, I do, now I know you're going to register at Target or somewhere. I'm board card in Target right now. You're going to register at Walmart, and you're going to have a gift registry, and they go, at Bed Bath & Beyond, they're going to buy you some silk sheets and, and silver spoons and stuff, but the best gift that you can be given mm, on your wedding day is that your spouse gives you the gift of their virginity and their purity. Now, before you get condemned, all right, I messed that up a long time ago. Many of you all, you've been through things. Some of you all have been violated. Watch this, but thank God for, for fresh beginnings and new starts, new, fresh starts and new beginnings. This is what I know about God, is that even if we've been through some things, when we get a revelation, it's not about our past, it's all about our future. <laughs> And I really believe that if you can make a decision in this series, if you're not married, that you're going to be celibate and keep your sex going forward until the day you say, I do, I believe you can give that as a gift to your spouse. You can give your celibacy for the next six months or the next six years and say, I've been waiting for you and I've been worth the wait. God will honor that. I'm talking about lies today. Y'all ready? <laughs> Number three, here's the third lie. Sex can be just the physical thing and nothing else. It's not true. Having sex with somebody is so much more than just the physical thing. It's a spiritual thing, y'all. It's a soulless thing, you guys. Your soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. And when you have sex with somebody, you create a soul tie. That's why when you get married to someone, if you've been just looking at pornography and been with all of these different people, you bring Pam and Sue and Linda and, you know, give me some, some ghetto name. <laughs> I was going to say Ronika, but she goes to the Gainesville campus. I just, I, I, I'm trying to think of Pookie. Bring, you bring Pookie. You're bringing everybody in. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. Stay with me. You're bringing everybody in to the marriage relationship with you. What's that? That's called a soul ties. And soul ties can be broken. So it is an emotional thing. There's no such thing as friends with benefits. Somebody's going to get hurt. And really, both of you all are hurting yourself because you're a slave to your sin. Number four, this is the fourth lie. It's okay to live together before marriage. I mean, come on, man, we got to try it before we buy it, right? It's a lie. Studies actually show us that the people who live together before they get married, percentage-wise, get divorced more than people who don't. Number five, y'all here with me? Here's the fifth lie. It would be boring to be with one person for the rest of my life. Everybody say, that's a lie. You know, well, I guess it's, it's true if you confuse what love and lust is. So what you really mean is that it's going to be, it's not going to feed your fetish. I mean, it's not going to feed your lust for the rest of your life to be, because this is what lust is. Lust is a taker. It's all about give me my sexuality and I need you to do this and I need you to do it this way. But love is a giver. How can I meet your needs? How can I bless you? What do you need from me? All right. And so it would be boring to be with one person the rest of my life. That's a lie. And I don't want to give you TMI today, but whatever, that's what I do. Me and Tabitha have been married for 24 years, and we have a very healthy intimacy life. And it's getting better at year 25 and year 30 and year 31. Why? Because now we have history. Now we have more intimacy. Now she knows me. And so the truth is that actually fidelity and monogamy actually make sex so much better because that's how it was created to be enjoyed. I got 17 people clapping, 35 of them is confused right now, it's all right. <laughs> Number six, here's the sixth lie, are you ready? The sixth lie, it's my body, my choice. Not true. If you are a Christian, your body belongs to the Lord, and the Lord is for your body. Romans 12 says that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service, or what we should do, right? Number seven. There is nothing I can do about my sexuality because I was born this way. Not true. You need to get born again. People need to get born again. And when you say yes to Jesus, you don't just give him the convenient parts of you. You're giving him your spirit, soul, body, your sexuality. Everything that you are, you put it at the feet of Jesus. Yes. All right? And so we all have been born with a sin nature. Some of us have been born to where we like variety more than monogamy. Okay? And so what you do when you get saved is that you have a sin that is not, uh, you have a flesh that's not saved. So for me, I enjoy variety, all right? And I know my flesh. I don't give my flesh what it wants. The Bible says that if you live by the flesh, you'll die. 
It says, but if you, by the Spirit, put the death, the deeds of the body, you shall live. Now, some of y'all, y'all mad at me, like, I don't believe that he said that. Yeah, you need to know where you are. You need to know your weaknesses. There are so many pastors falling because they don't know their weaknesses. I know my weaknesses, so I put all kinds of parameters around me, and that's how I've been faithful for over 20 years. I know what I'm talking about with this. You need to know that your flesh ain't saved truthfully, but some of you all have a natural propensity toward variety. Your papa was a Rolling Stone and so are you. Some of you all have a natural propensity toward same-sex attraction. You need to know that about yourself. Some of you all have a natural propensity towards what you've been watching on your screen when nobody else is around, some freaky deaky stuff. Y'all know some of y'all, just keep looking this way. But what I'm saying is, (laughs) when you come to Jesus, You die to self daily. You crucify the flesh daily. Now the life that I live, I live by the faith in the Son of God who gave his life for me so that I can walk in authority and victory. I don't know if y'all ready. Number eight, this is who I am. I can't change. It's not true. We see people change all of the time. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. You know, I, I don't want, you don't have to participate in this, but if you're here and you're willing to, to, to take this survey, if you say that you used to live sexually immoral, but now God's clean you up and you live sexually pure now, can you, by show of hands, anybody? There's a few people in here. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. So people are changing. Don't you dare believe that lie. But I know why people are believing the lie is because they've been told that your sexuality is actually who you are. It's a part of your self-worth and a part of your identity. And how dare we try to come at something that you cannot change because that's who you are. And it's just not true. You know, like people say, well, I'm a gay Christian, meaning that they put the title before their Christianity. That's like me saying I'm a black Christian or a white Christian or a Catholic Christian or a Baptist Christian. No, I'm a doggone Christian. Amen. What it means to be a Christian is that I resemble Christ and I don't need anything before that. Nothing goes before that. Nothing is going before him. I'm not a black Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a born of God with dark pigment. Leave me alone. Come on, somebody. And so you are not a bisexual or a homosexual. You are a person that's been created in the... Okay, let me ask you this. What sexuality was Jesus? Homosexual, heterosexual? Okay. Was he bisexual? You know what Jesus was? He was holy. So our message is not trying to make homosexuals heterosexuals. Our message is trying to make sinners holy. It's trying to make fallen, broken people be who God originally intended us to be in Eden before we mess this whole thing up. We're not trying to change your sexuality. What we're trying to do is point your sexuality to Jesus to leave it at the altar. I got to do it. You got to do it. Married people got to do it. Single people got to do it. Young people, y'all got to do it. Old people got to do it. And that's the truth. And truth will make us free. Number nine, you can't help who you love. That's not true. You better help who you love. Come on. You can't fall in love with my wife. We've been married 24 years. Well, I just love, you see how she up here looking at me? No, she ain't looking at you. You might think she's looking at you, but she's just doing a scan right now. She ain't looking at you. You, you. you better help who you love. You can't love my daughter. She's 14 and you're 64. You cannot love her. You can't help who you love. You got to put some discipline and parameters about who, what you do with your sex drive and who you are. Number 10, here's another lie. You just need to follow your heart. Just need to follow your heart. You need to follow your heart. The Bible says that your heart is deceitfully wicked. And so instead of following your heart, you should follow the one that can give you a new heart. Number 11, just because I have same sex attraction, I must be gay. Not true. Jesus, the Bible says, was tempted at every point like we are. Jesus was tempted to lie. He was tempted to murder, tempted to be jealous, and he was tempted with same-sex attraction, but he never sinned, so he never gave in to those temptations. Some of you all, you're tempted so much, you're just like, oh, I guess that's how I am. No, with all temptation, he makes a way of escape. Come next week, we're going to just deal with temptation. Because so many people don't know how to live and man, God knows how much temptation is out there. You can't about turn on Instagram or TikTok. Oh my God. What is this? What is this? Right? 
You would have to be blind not to be tempted. But just because I'm tempted doesn't mean that I receive the temptation as a part of my identity. Jesus was tempted at all points but never sinned. Number 12, you are attacking me if you don't agree with me. That's a lie. Those are two different things. Just because I don't agree with you doesn't mean I, I, I don't love you. Amen. Actually, sometimes it means that I do love you because love has a correction component attached to it. The Father loves who he corrects. I'm going to be honest with you guys. It would be easy for me to preach on anything other than this. But I love you enough that I don't even care. You can tell by the look on my face that I don't care. I love you enough that you can talk bad about me. You can go out and, and tell lies about me. You can counsel me. You can try to counsel me, but you can't because God's hand is on me. You can do whatever you want to do. I don't even care because I'm living my life for the audience of one. And I love you enough to give you truth in a world that's telling you lies because it's only truth that'll make you free. So I think we need to start posting this. When people say crazy stuff, I don't agree with you, but I still love you. It's okay to tell people, I don't agree with you, but I do still love you because those are two different things. Number 13, here's the lie. Y'all ready for this one? Gender is fluid and it's based upon how you feel. That's not true at all. It's not true on an anatomy level. It's not true on a biological level. It's not even true on a genetic level. We've all been made in the image and likeness of God. So when in Genesis it says that he created a male and female, he didn't make no mistakes when he gave those genders away. So if you are a woman, you are a female, you were born with reproduction organs and two X chromosomes, you need to embrace your femininity. God didn't make no mistakes when he made you. He gave you your personality. He gave you your perspectives. He gave you that nurturing, caring heart. It is a gift of God that the world wants you to turn around. No, you need to embrace who you are as a woman. If you are a man, you need to embrace your masculinity. God didn't make any mistakes when he made you. He made you exactly how he wanted to make you. You know what I'm saying? Oh my God. So on an anatomy, biological, genetic level, okay, a man has an X and a Y chromosome. A woman always has a two X chromosomes. There's there's nothing that you can do to change that. It doesn't matter how many surgeries we have, how many hormones I put in my body. And they will say what I'm saying is hate speech. This is actually love speech. The fact that I will tell another person that's struggling in their identity not to take off parts of their body because God made you fearfully and wonderfully created by God. We want to help you know who you are and walk out your destiny and purpose is not hate speech. It is actually love speech. <laughs> it's crazy. Are y'all with me today? Yes. Number 14, number 14. It's okay for me to flirt and talk to somebody outside of my marriage if my needs aren't being met at home. Well, that's a lie. <laughs> the Bible says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. It's not just talking physically, it's also talking emotionally. Yes. And you are emotionally stroking people that you work with. You're emotionally talking to your barista, flirting with other people. And an emotional affair is still an affair. Number 15, here's the lie. It's okay to watch pornography as long as you watch it with your spouse. Uh, that's a lie. The Bible says that we shouldn't put our eyes on ungodly things. And so yes, if you are watching pornography with your spouse, you are bringing something demonic and unholy into something that's, un that's holy. Number 16, here's the lie. If I've sinned sexually or been violated sexually, I'm no good to God. Somebody shout, that's a, lie. that's a lie. If that was the case, I wouldn't be being used right now by God. You cannot change your past, but you can change your future. There is nothing that you can do about what's happened to you or the sins and the mistakes that you've made from the past other than learn from it. But what I've learned about God is sometimes he takes people with the murkiest of pasts and give them a greater mantle for the future. God, oh God, I love you is the kind of God that would have a prophet named Hosea. He said, go marry this prostitute. And Hosea was like, what you say? God says, I want you to go marry the prostitute. Hosea, with his obedient self, went and married her, brought her into the house. She had a couple babies. Then she went back to whoredom, the Bible says. And then God says, I want you to go out into the streets and I want you to pay for her and bring her back home. The devil is a liar, right? 
And God did that because he wants to show you how much he loves sinners, that he will move heaven and earth and hell to get to your heart. He will do whatever. So he is not mad at you. Watch this. He's madly in love with you. He wants to restore you and he wants to use you. And some of you all that have been entangled in this kind of sin is the exact people that's going to have a road to Damascus experience where God is going to help you untangle the sin of the people that you used to be in community with. When they see the light of the gospel in you, come on somebody, I prophetically declare that. That was just for somebody in here. Mm -mm -mm. Last but not least, number 17. I got more, but we're going to go to number 17. Here's the lie. Church people are mean and controlling and judgmental. That's a lie. Now I know that there's some people out there that ain't crazy, right? (laughs) How many of y'all went to the crazy church before? (laughs) It must be more popular than what I thought. (laughs) I never went to that church, but people tell me all the time, right? So I'm I'm just not cut from that cloth. But here's, here's what I do know. People are not perfect just because they love Jesus. They're still, we're all at different levels of our growth and understanding of his kingdom and his will, okay? But honestly, I've preached the gospel in most continents around the world, and I've met thousands, if not millions, probably, let's just say thousands, not to exaggerate, of Christians around the world. And honestly, they're some of the most humble people, some of the most caring people that will take care of the poor. There are people in this room right now that if you were living outside, they would open up their home and don't even know you and let you come live with them. I had over 19 people live with me over a nine year period. (laughs) I'm talking about people that I just met and I felt like in my heart that I needed to help this person. I remember being in meetings like this and the Lord would say, hey, this person don't have a car. You got an extra one, give them a car. Christians can be some of the most warm, some of the most caring, some of the most generous people that you ever have met. So here's what I need you to know. I'm not afraid of your sin because I've had a sin of my own. But in the church, what the devil is telling you, that people are wanting to judge you and we're just narrow and we don't care about the world, that is a lie. We built this whole thing and I don't need money. I had a lot of money before I did this whole church thing. I'm doing this because I want my life to, to, be, to, to mean more than just what you see right now. I want to have eternal purposes. I want to have eternal rewards. This is not for money. This is not fame. I don't like going to the Walmart and people knowing me. I don't like any of it. I don't like any of the pressure. I don't like any of the warfare. This is about love. Okay? And so, I want you to know that this church is filled with people. I don't care about your sexual past. We will get in there and we will pray with you. We will go out to coffee with you. Yes. We will cast the devil out to you if we got to. We will counsel you. We will be there for, we will fight. You can call us at 2 a.m. in the morning. We might not pick up, but we will call you back when we get up. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Yeah. Now, if you want to go out and fight this battle by yourself, acting like we don't love you, you're believing a lie. And it's only truth that can make you free. Yes, sir. This is the best place to be. Amen. Come on. Anybody here never sinned before? Show of hands. You're not paying attention. You're not paying attention to what I'm saying. <laughs> I said, did anybody here never sin before? <laughs> Why? Because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So I'm not here to pick on your sin when I've been a sinner myself. I'm here to say that I was blind, but now I see. And if you want to see what I see, come to church because we're going to help you. Would somebody give God praise in the house today? Do I got any people that used to be ratchet? Do I got any people that used to be crazy? Do I got anybody that used to be out there twerking, but God's now called you to holiness? Give God praise in the house of God today. (laughs) I got to go. We got one more service, but watch this. Here's my thing. How to walk in truth. Three keys. Maestro, you got to identify the liar. His name is Satan. You are not wrestling against flesh and blood. There is a devil, and he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's not your friend. Number two. You got to know the truth. You have to grab your Bible in this generation and hold on to it, (laughs) y'all. You can't let the Word of God go. You can't just come and hear me preach what I know about the Bible. You need to go home and check out the scriptures of what I said for yourself because my faith can't help you in the middle of the battle. Your faith got to help you in the middle of the battle. 
Listen, I can't take the test as a teacher. All I can do is say, I've taken the test before. I'm going to teach you what I know, but the test is coming to your address. And I want you to be ready. So you got to get hold of the Bible, quote the Bible, study the Bible, speak the Bible, declare the Bible, get other people in your life that know the Bible, listen to podcasts, put down the Drake, praise God, and get in the Word of God and build your spirit up. Because the Word is truth. Somebody shout, the word is truth. You don't have truth without the word of God. And number three, how to walk in truth. You got to replace lies with truth. <laughs> Some of y'all been holding on to your lie. I just want to hold on to it. I like it. The number one thing you need for freedom. I give up the lie. God, give me your truth. Because it's only truth that will make me free. There's freedom in this place. I said there's freedom in this place. Can I pray with everybody here online? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I have two appeals for you, and I just want your obedience to God. This is not about the person on your left or right. This is between you and God. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm not saved, but I want to be. I'm not a Christian but I want to know Jesus. If you're here today and you can admit that you've ever sinned because of your sinfulness, you are separated from God because of his holiness. But he loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus who died for all of your sinfulness and he took your place. Salvation is not for perfect people, it's for surrendered people. If you're here today and you can humbly admit that you're not perfect and that you've sinned, guess what, you're in need of a savior. And you can come to him just like you are, but he ain't going to leave you where you are. <laughs> He's going to clean you up. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be made right with God. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want a relationship with the truth today. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to boldly just lift up your hand and wave at me. Then you can put it down. If that's you, I would love to pray with you. Would you lift up your hand on one, two, Three, if that's you and you say, pray with me, lift up your hand all over the building. Thank you, I see your hand. Come on, lift it up high. I can't see them all. Thank you, I see your hand. Thank you, I see your hand. Thank you, I see your hand. Thank you, I see your hand online. My second appeal is this. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I've been doing it my way sexually. And man, it's been hard, but I want to do it God's way. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Ken, pray for me. I want to recommit my body and my sexuality back to God. I want to be forgiven. I want to be sexually pure, so help me God. On the count of three, if that's you, lift up your hand. One, two, three. Lift up your hand. Say, that's me. I'm recommitting my sexuality back to God. Oh, I see your hand. God sees it. Oh, glory, glory, glory. You can put your hands down. Nobody prays alone. Let's pray these prayers together. Say this, Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. I surrender my will, my way for yours. Thank you for dying on a cross so that I could live. From this day forward, you're mine. <laughs> my Savior, my Lord, my God. <sighs> Father, I thank you for every person that's recommitting their life to you today. I pray that they are renouncing and repenting sexual sins and you're giving them boldness. Ooh, I declare a spirit of boldness to live counterculturally. And I declare that the shackles that have held you captive to your past are broken now in Jesus' name. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. If you receive that, would you put praise on it and just thank Him for freedom in the atmosphere? Thank Him for freedom in the atmosphere. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it. And he illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in Alive Church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. 
All right, if you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, it'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow to the ministry of Alive Church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.